So hi everyone and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, today it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, my former boss at the uh, University of Kent, Martin Bass, when I was uh, doing uh, my last postdoc before coming here. So Martin uh, did his uh, PhD and the master uh, both in mathematics, but the PhD had uh, an astrophysical focus. It was about uh, studying the effect of stellar of dust on stellar kinematics, from which the radiative transfer code skirt uh, uh, was was born. Then he uh, became um, assistant professor in 2004 already. So when he was barely uh, 30, I guess. And uh, he spent uh, one year as an ISO fellow in Chile. So for the students who uh, are ashamed to speak English, I think he can take also uh, uh, questions in Spanish. And then uh, in 2010, he became uh, uh, associate professor. And since 2014, he's a full professor, always at uh, uh, the University of, of Ghent. His main uh, research uh, topics are uh, dust radiative transfer, uh, the properties of dust in galaxies, uh, uh, infrared astronomy, and uh, uh, also I think he has some papers on black holes. But, and being a mathematician, he's have, he has developed uh, uh, he or he has uh, like let's say some papers on um, on uh, on geometry of uh, of galaxies. And today he will talk about uh, uh, models of galaxy from uh, uh, hydrodynamic simulation and uh, synthetic observations. So that's to you, Martin. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jacopo. It's a pity I cannot be in Morelia, but it's nice to be with you a little bit. Um, I will share my screen. You should see this now. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so welcome everybody again. So my name is Martin Bath from Ghent University. Um, I'm going to talk to you about galaxy evolution and unbiased comparison of cosmological simulations and multi-wavelength observations. And this is work that I have done in collaboration with many people. Um, some, uh, most of them from our team in Ghent, but some outside people as well. Uh, you see some names, but there are more people that, of course, collaborated on these different projects. Just to give you an idea, oh, does this work? Where I am, I am here now on this little green thing. This country is Belgium, You're, you are here. And um, so it's a far, far away, but... Um, I'm glad to be with you. I also looked on the internet and apparently there's a lot of things in common between Belgium and Mexico. There's whole web pages on that, but I'm not going into details there. Good. Ooh, how, why does it not work? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about cosmological hydrodynamic simulations. Um, this is a hot topic nowadays in, in the galaxy evolution community. And it's one of the main techniques how we try to find out how galaxies form and evolve through cosmic time. And this is relatively new that this tool has become so popular. And the reason is that until about 10 years ago, because these simulations exist for a long time, it's, it's in principle, it's a, it's a fairly simple idea. You have a box of matter with dark matter and gas and you, put in some physical recipes, how gas forms stars and how stars evolve and so on. And then you try to create galaxies in a cosmological framework. So this idea exists for a long time, but until fairly recently, the galaxies that were formed in these simulations did not look like observed galaxies at all. They were either too small or too thick, or there were a lot of things that went wrong. And it's only since about 10 years that people really managed to run these simulations in a full cosmological framework and that the result is a simulated universe that tends to look like the observed universe. Um, and that is mainly because of two reasons. One of them is that some of the numerical schemes have improved substantially. 
Um, so the, the ways we, we treat gravity and hydrodynamics has become much more powerful and also the computers have much become much more powerful. Um, and because of this growth of computing power, the resolution was always better and better resolution is key to producing more realistic galaxies. And the second reason is that people have realized that a number of physical recipes needed to be included to generate galaxies that look like the galaxies we see today. And mainly different feedback recipes were discovered to be very necessary. And then we look at feedback by supernovae and feedback by AGNs. And so by tuning these different um, feedback processes, the, the galaxies, these hydro simulations create, look much more like the universe we see today. And some of the projects you see there listed on the right are some of the most important simulations we have today. They're all large scale uh, cosmological simulations. Um, I'm gonna talk most about the Eagle simulation because that's the one that we've been working most with in our group, but there's also different ones. And that's a typical example of one of these large scale cosmological simulations. It's actually a suite of simulations. So there's different boxes or different volumes with sizes going from 25 to 100 megaparsec cubed. And the material in these boxes, so dark matter, uh, baryonic matter, so gas, and then it forms stars and so on, is followed through cosmic time all the way from, uh, from the very early universe to today. Um, and it, it all runs according to the, 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 the laws of gravity, of course, and then the gas laws, so uh, uh, hydrodynamics, and that's done with the SPH method. Um, and that contains up to 3 billion particles. So that's really a huge, huge number of particles. And still, because there's so many particles, but the volumes are large, the resolutions are typically about 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth solar masses. So if you have a galaxy of 10 to the 10 solar masses, it's only a few thousand particles per galaxy. So these are these very huge simulations. Um, but there's, and, and, and these simulations contain a number of free parameters in their recipes, typically feedback efficiencies or star formation parameters. And these, what we call subgrid parameters, have been calibrated such that the simulation agrees with typically the galaxy stellar mass function in the universe today. So different simulations have different calibrations. And for example, for Eagle, it was calibrated to reproduce the mass function, the stellar mass function, but also the mass size relation. Um, but there's also a lot of other scaling relations observed in the nearby universe, like the Tully Fisher relation and so on. And it turns out that the Eagle simulation reproduces these also fairly well, without that, that is really imposed on the calibration. Um, a, a slightly more recent technique, apart or, or, or similar, but, but focusing on other goals, is zoom simulations. So these are also high uh, or also cosmological simulations, but they use a technique in which they first run a big simulation and then they pick a small part, typically focusing on, on say, a galaxy or a few galaxies, and they re-simulate this part at higher resolution. And one of the projects that we're working with as well is Auriga. And so Auriga is a project that re-simulated a set of about 50 Milky Way type galaxies in um, moving mesh MHD simulations. So not with SPH, but in moving mesh hydrodynamics and taking into account magnetic fields. Um, but still, because it, it is cut from a bigger cosmological volume, it actually still is run in a full cosmological context. And the advantage there is that the mass resolution there is much better. The disadvantage there is that you don't have a full population of galaxies. So both of these approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. Now, one of the problems in using cosmological simulations to study galaxy evolution is that you do not directly predict 
the observed universe. So hydrodynamic simulations, what they typically contain is a huge number of particles, and each particle represents either a, a stellar population or represents a gas particle, or this can be a cell depending on your hydrodynamics setup. But that is in 3D, and so you have the full 3D con configuration of your galaxy. On the other hand, if you have observations, that is the 2D distribution of light on the plane of the sky. So you don't observe the full 3D structure. So if you want to compare your simulations to observations, you can either try to convert your observations to a 3D structure, or you can do the other way around. And that is, in my view and in, in many people's view, the most reliable approach. So if we want to compare cosmological hydro simulations to observations, we must produce realistic mock observations. So we must create synthetic observations based on the output of the hydrodynamic simulations. And then you can directly compare apples to apples. And so this is an, an interesting field. It's about the, the boundary between simulations and observations. And that's where I and, and the group I'm working in is working in. And for example, this is an example, not from our group. This is simulated images from the illustrious simulation where the galaxies that have formed in this simulation at redshift zero are now turned into images by assigning every particle uh, an SCD and then generating these images. So that's all fine. Now there's one big problem and that is interstellar dust. So that is a very minor fraction of the interstellar medium in galaxies. Typically the dust to gas ratio is about one to 100 or one to 200. So it's a very tiny percentage of the mass in galaxies. But it is an annoying thing for many people, like people working in the UV or optical, they typically don't like dust because dust is hiding what is so interesting for them. If you look at this image here of uh, the antennae, everything, this is, is a collision between these two galaxies and all the star formation or the most massive star formation is, is happening here in this, in this part, but that's all hidden behind layers of dust. So dust blocks the optical and UV light. Dust also emits radiation at long wavelengths, and that's annoying for microwave astronomers, especially for the CMB people, because they want to look at the, the background radiation at microwave wavelengths, but our own Milky Way is also prominently emitting in the infrared, in the infrared and, and microwave regime because of uh, dust. So that's annoying, but on the other hand, there's a lot of people who also like dust because it's a crucial ingredient in the interstellar medium. It regulates the physical and chemical conditions of the interstellar gas. So the heating and the cooling is dominated by dust related effects. Um, and also, for example, the production of molecular hydrogen depends on surface reactions on dust grains. It catalyzes star formation, it's crucial for planet formation, and in the end, we're also, we're all made of stardusts. Um, but if we look at galaxies and we wanna compare the properties of galaxies to simulations, this is a typical effect of dust. So what you see in red is a SED, a spectral energy distribution. That's the total energy output of a galaxy as a function of wavelength, going all the way from here, the UV, over the optical, near infrared, mid infrared, far infrared, and so millimeter wavelength ranges. And the black points are one galaxy. This is HRS122. And so this line is the best fitting model through these data points. So that's the typical spectral energy distribution of a typical spiral galaxy. And you see two big bumps. This is the UV to near infrared bump that is all the energy emitted by stars. But you see a second bump as well here, and this is all the energy emitted by dust. And so all this dust energy is actually absorbed stellar radiation. 
So if we would see the same galaxy without dust, it would be the blue line. So you would see much more flux, much more luminosity in the UV part. And the reason is that this stellar emission is seriously attenuated by dust. So dust grains absorb the UV and optical radiation, and then they re-emit it in the mid-infrared and far-infrared and sublimeter. So an SCD of a galaxy is completely changed by the presence of dust, even though dust is such a small, small part of the total mass budget. And you see this very nicely demonstrated in this beautiful image of Andromeda, where you see, of course, old stars in the bulge, you see younger stars in the disk and the spiral arms. And then you see these dark patches that is exactly dust that is absorbing all a, a big part of the UV and optical radiation. And if we look at the same galaxy in the far infrared, and that's what we did um, with Herschel, and that's uh, Jacopo was the PI of this project. If we look at this same galaxy in the far infrared, you get exactly there where the dust was eating away the stellar radiation, you get the strongest emission in the infrared. And if you combine the two, you get this nice uh, comparison between those two points. And this is not a minor part. Um, we looked at how much of or which fraction of the total stellar emission is absorbed by dust and then re-emitted in the far infrared and that we call the bolometric attenuation. So it's just the total fraction of the total bolometric luminosity of a galaxy that is reprocessed by dust. And this, in, in this graph, you see this plotted for a, a whole sample of galaxies as a function of Hubble type. Um, and if we look at the average, more or less, we see that dust absorbs 30 to 50% of all the starlight in the universe and converts it to infrared radiation. So it is a crucial, crucial part if we want to compare simulations to observations that we take that into account. Now, how do we do that? This is my only formula. Um, you get radiative transfer. So radiative transfer describes the interaction between radiation and material, and so dust, for example. And so if you want to take into account how the, the dust is processing the material, you have to solve this equation. That's an annoying equation. Um, it is known as one of the most difficult numerical problems in astrophysics, because this is a in partial integral differential equation in six dimensions. So you have to, you have to work in six dimensions. So you have three space dimensions, two directions, because radiation can be shooting in any direction. And there's a wavelength dimension. And all of these dimensions are coupled. So radiation can change location, of course, but can also change propagation direction, can change wavelength. All these different dimensions are coupled. Um, often you have to solve this equation in a, in a complicated geometry, because it's, it's a 3D galaxy with, with with clumpy material, inhomogeneous, so it, it's, that makes it even harder. And the optical properties of the dust, which determine how much radiation is absorbed and scattered, they are relatively poorly known, so that adds up to the problem. And that is only to calculate how much energy is taken away, is absorbed by the dust. If you then want to calculate how much energy is emitted, you can in principle do that because if you know where all the energy is absorbed, you can determine the radiation field, then you can calculate the dust temperature distribution, so you can calculate how much dust is at which temperature, and then you can predict the thermal emission in the infrared. Now that's by itself already not a simple problem. If you want to couple that to rate of transfer, you get a very nasty problem. But it is doable, and it, for a long time, that was also a very challenging problem. But thanks to increased methods and also mainly increased computing power, we are now capable of really doing 3D dust radiative transfer. Meaning, if you have a distribution of light and you know where your dust is, you can calculate how this object would look like at any wavelength. 
And a few years ago, we wrote a review paper on 3D dust radiative transfer. And I must say, if I look at this review now, many things again have changed. So this is a very dynamic field with new codes, new methods popping up uh, on a very regular basis. Um, and this is the SCIRT code. So SCIRT is one of these radiative transfer codes that um, I've been working on for almost 20 years now, and not only me, but uh, many people. And um, I will present SCIRT to you in, in just a nutshell. So SCIRT is a Monte Carlo code. Um, and a Monte Carlo radiative transfer code means that we follow a huge number of individual photon packages. And huge, I, I don't mean thousands or a million, we follow billions of photon packages. Everyone I am sorry. <laughs> sorry? Can I, uh, sorry, can I interrupt you or, or is better at the end for you? Um, for me, that's fine. Uh, I was just wondering with the skirt uh, if um, you can only use it to, to compute the, the radiated transfer for dust. It's only because of dust or? No, we're also working on lime and alpha, for example. Okay. And um, we're working on gas radiative transfer as well. So there's, there's oh, development okay, okay. on many fronts. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. So it is a Monte Carlo code, meaning so we follow a lot of photon packages. And the path or, or like the life cycle of every individual photon package is determined by random number. That's why it's Monte Carlo code. So we randomly determine where a photon is emitted. We randomly determine in which direction. Then we randomly determine whether it will be absorbed or scattered or not, and so on and so on. And once we finished with one package, we start with the next one. And we repeat that cycle for so many packages that in the end we get a very good statistic. Um, so there are quite a number of Monte Carlo radiative transfer codes in many different fields. So also not only in astrophysics, but also in, in uh, climate uh, modeling or, or in oceanography or, or in, in many different uh, fields. Now, what I think makes SCIRT special among its uh, colleagues or competitors or how you want to call it, is that we decided to equip it with a large library of supporting material. So we have a large library of SED models. So if you want to model a galaxy, you can pick from many different SEDs for the stars, for galaxies, for AGNs, and so on. We have a number of input geometry models. For example, this is what, you put, what we see here this thing we can just generate with things that are built in the code. So you can include clumpies, you can include a dusty torus, and so on. Um, this shooting of photons runs, of course, on a grid. So we need to impose a certain grid structure where the photons fly through. And we have implemented many different grid structures, going from rectangular Cartesian grids to to these octree grids as you see here, or Voronoi grids or anything in between. And we have different dust models or different properties. And responding to your question, we also have uh, scattering by electrons. We're working on X-rays uh, scattering. Um, we, we now have lime and alpha scattering and so on. So there's different things that are being worked on, but the focus is still on dust. Um, the physics that are included is absorption, scattering, thermal emission, polarization, kinematics, and several other things that, I, um, that are more specific here. And what I really want to stress is that SCIRT is an open development code. That, so that's even, even better in my view than an open source code. So everyone can use it, but everyone can also contribute to SCIRT. So if you want to use it, that's that's fine, that's perfect. If you want to develop or, or help or, or you have something that you say, well, I would like to do this with Skirt. Can you do that? Can we do that? It's always nice if people uh, contribute with skirts in collaboration with us. And many people have done that uh, by now. Um, 
So Skirt is being used for several applications. I just list a single one that our group is, is working on, um, except the hydro simulations that, the, the, that my talk is about. This is about dust heating in galaxies. So if a galaxy contains dust, it gets heated by absorbing stellar radiation. But it's not necessarily clear whether it's mainly heated by young stars, because these young stars are very luminous and very UV um, rich. So only a few stars can heat a lot of dust, but there are not so many of them. On the other hand, there's a lot of older stars. They are less luminous, and especially in the UV, but there's, there are many of them. And so there is some discussion on what is the main heating agent of the dust in galaxies. Is it the young stars or is it the many old stars? And so we, we set up a technique to fit images of galaxies, make up a model that fits galaxies. You see this here, this is M83, is a spiral galaxy. You see observed images from the UV, optical, near infrared, mid infrared, far infrared, and so millimeter. This is the observed images. This is the best fitting skirt model to these images. And if we set up such a 3D model, we can of course then analyze the entire internal 3D structure of this galaxy. And we can, we can just measure um, what the dust is heated by. And this is a summary plot in the from the paper of Nersesian where we see that the fraction of dust heated by young stars is nicely correlated with the specific star formation rate. So in regions of a galaxy where the specific star formation is low, where there's few young stars, we have that almost all the dust is heated by old stars, and of course the other way around at this side of the diagram. But different galaxies tend to follow all the same relation roughly here, um, and it agrees also with uh, other uh, analysis in this kind. Good, but the focus is on creating synthetic observations with SCIRT for hydro simulations. And also there we set up a framework to start with, say, a snapshot. So if you have this hydro simulation, every galaxy is just a collection of particles or cells that are either stars or gas. And so what we then do is we look at the stellar particles and looking if their stellar particles are older than 100 mega years, we assign a Bruce charlot stellar template to them, and that becomes a star particle as input for SCUD. If it is a younger stellar particle, we assign another and so on. So I don't, it's not so important what this is here. The point is we can convert an eagle snapshot into a model that is a starting point for a radio transfer simulation. So starting from a snapshot, we have a 3D distribution of sources and dust, and then we can start to calculate how these things look like. And for example, then we set up a grid that, that's, that follows the galaxy where most dust is, that you have higher resolution, or this can be Voronoi grids or so on, and then you start shooting photons forever and ever, and you do that on a cluster, then it goes a bit quicker. And the result is then that you have an image of a galaxy. So this is a simulated image or, or a simulated movie of the Aries galaxy. Aries is one of the earliest kind of realistic simulations, hydro simulations for galaxies. And you see that if you look at this galaxy from different viewpoints, it tends to look like a real galaxy. And we've done that for more galaxies. This is again Aries, but now this is again the optical image, so an RGB image more or less, looking at different viewing angles. Now this is the same galaxy, but now looking at it in the infrared. So this is how the Aries galaxy would look like at far infrared wavelengths. And you can do that for all kinds of simulations. This is work not by our team, but this is work from TNG 50, simulation by Vogelsberger et al. So we see these very nice dust lanes at Redshift 2. Um, this is a galaxy at Redshift 5 from the Fire 2 simulations by Ma et al. And so 
you can then generate images and SCDs and colors and all um, at different uh, wavelengths. And going back to the um, Eagle simulation, because that is the one that we've been working with most. And if you look, this is the same graph as I showed before. This is the huge volume of Eagle. If you zoom into this thing, this is like the hot gas that you see here. And you see a concentration of gas. This is a single galaxy. And what you see here is a synthetic image of this galaxy created with skirt, so an optical image. And this has been done for all galaxies in the Eagle volume, like and in, in the the big Eagle volume simulation, so the 100 megaparsec cube simulation, there's about 6,000 galaxies at redshift zero. And so for all of these galaxies, we have generated images and we've done that at all the different redshifts and for all the different flavors of the Eagle simulation. So in the end, we have looked at many, many tens of thousands of galaxies. Um, and you see, you have these galaxies like a spiral-like galaxy face on an edge on, and this is more like an irregular merging type galaxy um, face on edge on and a random inclination. And to demonstrate the, not only the power of radio transfer, but also the need for radio transfer, um, this is the color magnitude diagram um, for Eagle. Well, not really color magnitude, this is instead of magnitude, it's stellar mass. So it's the color stellar mass diagram. Um, and first look at the lines, not, don't look at the colors yet. If you look at this diagram, stellar mass versus color, you typically have two kinds of galaxies. On the one hand, you have this red sequence. So these are galaxies that are luminous and red. And they're typically elliptical early type galaxies that lie along a well-defined sequence. On the other hand, you have galaxies that typically, typically the galaxies that are a bit less luminous are bluer, and that's what we call the blue cloud. And the maximum of this blue cloud is here. So it's, it's lower mass galaxies, a lot bluer. And so this is, this is actually a bimodal distribution in this plane. Now, if you look at these colors, this is the same distribution, but now for the Eagle galaxies. And that is just the Eagle galaxies without any rate of transfer processing. And you see, overall, the galaxies lie in the same parameter space. That's nice. But the red sequence is not really there. See, there's, there's no, the galaxies are, is a maximum here. And also the blue cloud, they're not really where they should be. So, the distribution of Eagle galaxies in this plane is not really agreeing with the observations very well. But if you look, if you use skirts, if you use a rate of transfer code to generate fluxes and colors, taking into account dust attenuation in a proper way, you now see that this red sequence is appearing. So the red sequence is appearing and the blue cloud is way more where it should be. So the, the power of rate of transfer is that it puts galaxies in the right place of the color magnitude diagram. Um, that is just optical colors, of course. And our focus of our group is mainly on what we call the panchromatic data. So we, we want to generate data going all the way from the UV to the submillimeter range, and then look at the, the the comparison between data and simulations over this broad wavelength range. And this is work by Peter Kamps from his PhD thesis. Now he's now a postdoc in the Institute and he's the, the current SCIRT um, master. So if you want to do something with SCIRT, he will uh, gladly help you out or help to set up your simulations. Um, this is an, a, a typical Eagle galaxy where you now have a combined image going with optical in, in yellowish color and then the farm red in the red face on an edge on. And now we can again compare whether the observation, whether the simulated data agree a little bit with the observations. And for example, we can look here at the um, total infrared flux or total infrared luminosity 
that is a typical measure for the star formation rate. So if we use these standard recipes to, to translate total infrared luminosity to star formation rate, we get the position on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we put the actual star formation rate of the galaxy, because for every galaxy, we know the star formation rate from the simulation. We just count how many, how many stars are being formed because we follow the galaxy through time. And so if we compare those two, we see a very nice agreement between star formation rate and total infrared luminosity. And the same star formation rate with now 24 micron luminosity. And if we look at this plane, this is the specific dust mass. So the ratio between dust mass and stellar mass as a function of optical color, you see again that the, the red dots are eagle and the points are the um, data from the HRS, so observed data, you see that the galaxies agree fairly well. But we want to go one step further and really look at the entire UV to submillimeter wavelength range. And for that, we compared our, the, our Eagle galaxies with Dospedia. And Dospedia is a big project that we were involved with, a European sponsored project, to look at about 1,000 galaxies in the nearby universe for which we have this panchromatic data all the way from UV to submillimeter. And so the idea was to compare these observed galaxies to the Eagle universe. And looking at the SEDs, this looks quite promising. So you have here three SEDs plotted all the way from UV to submillimeter wavelengths. And this one is an observed galaxy. This is the Dustpedia galaxy, this is NGC 4569 while the other two ones are synthetic SEDs generated by means of skirt. And you see they agree fairly well. So they're shifted, of course, vertically. Um, the main difference is here in the far UV, where this slope is much steeper than what we have with the skirt in the eagle. And so if we study this in a bit more detail, we find overall a fairly good agreement between eagle and the Spedia. So Eagle, I, re I remind you, that's about, that's, that's about 6,000 galaxies in the big box. That's called Ref 100. We also have a higher resolution simulation, which, which is called Recall 25. So that's a simulation where the resolution is eight bigger, H times 10. Of course, there's fewer galaxies then. Um, and you see, like in this plane with 3.4 micron, that's a proxy for stellar mass. 250 micron is a proxy for dust mass. The, the three samples agree fairly well, meaning the Dustpedia galaxies and the Eagle galaxies look very similar in that plane. And that's the fact actually in, in, in many different um, scaling relations. And this is one where we do see a little bit of difference. Where, and this is the 22 micron over 3.4, so this is a proxy for specific star formation, because 22 micron is a star formation rate tracer. And this is, again, a proxy for specific dust mass, so dust mass over stellar mass. And you see then the Eagle galaxies are here, while the pink line or magenta line is the Dustpedia galaxies. There's a little bit of an offset here. It turns out, actually, that the Eagle galaxies have, on average, too high 22 micron flux. And that can be due, due to two reasons. It could be that either every galaxy has a little bit too much flux there, or it could be that the populations don't agree. It could be that the Eagle universe contains, on average, way more galaxies that are star forming than passive galaxies. And so we did further analysis on this. This, by the way, is work by a PhD student in our team, uh, Anna Trichka. And so what she did is separate the galaxies in Eagle and in the Spedia into um, passive galaxies and active galaxies. So galaxies that are mainly star forming with a high specific star formation rate are blue, in blue color here. The more passive galaxies are in red. And so if we look at the scaling relations, for example, the 22 microluminosity versus star formation rate, that is a very nice line for the blue galaxies. 
and less so for the red ones. Indeed, for red, one, red galaxies, they don't contain many young stars. So the 22 micron flux is not entirely due to that. And we see the same thing in the high resolution Eagle simulation and in the Spedia. But there you see you have a much larger population of red passive galaxies. And the reason is not that these galaxies do not exist in the Eagle universe. They just don't have enough dust, so we cannot run rate transfer on them. So the difference we find between these distributions is not because of fundamental physical differences in the galaxies, but because of the population of dusty galaxies, uh, dust, dust, relatively dust-free passive galaxies that we're missing in our uh, eagle skirt sample. And the same is here for the uh, bolometric attenuation. And if we look back, at, look further at the entire population, this is what we call, or what is called, the cosmic spectral energy distribution. So that is essentially just if you take all the galaxies in a certain volume and you add up all of their SEDs, you get what is called the cosmic SED. So it just, as you see here at the units, it's just the power that is emitted for a given volume of universe. Of course, this should be a big volume. Um, and so because we had all these fluxes and all these luminosities for the Eagle galaxies already, we could just add them all together and then we end up with the green line here, the green dots and the green line. And if we compare that to the observed cosmic spectral energy distribution from the gamma survey, this is from a paper from Andrews et al., that is the gray dots. And so there was no fitting at all. There was no fine tuning. It was just straight comparison between what we already had calculated and the data from this paper. And that is actually a quite impressive comparison. Now, there are a number of discrepancies like this line, but this is not really trustworthy. You should better look at this one. There are a number of small discrepancies here at the level of a few, uh, let's say, ten, few tens percent. Uh, overall, the only, the biggest difference is in the UV, and that is a problem that is very hard to solve, um, and that we think is mainly due to resolution effects. Um, we can also look at infrared luminosity functions and dust mass functions. So luminosity function is fairly simple. You just count the number of galaxies with a certain luminosity in a certain bin and you make a histogram. And if we do that, because we have all these data, we have the gray luminosity function that you see here. This is luminosity function at 250 micron. So that is cool dust emission. Same at 350, same at 500. So we can generate this and directly compare that to observations. And again, we agree very well with the observations, except maybe in the high luminosity tail. And that is because there's some reasons for that. For example, we don't have AGN emission in our Eagle post-processing yet. So that can explain why there's a little bit of discrepancy here. But overall, we're extremely happy with this comparison. Same with the total infrared luminosity function, agrees very well with observations. The dust mass function, again, a slight underestimation here, but I think this is a very good uh, comparison. Sorry, what happens, what happens with the low luminosity limit? So the what is happening there? Limit. I don't know whether because, I can... I mean, what do you mean? also? So there, 10 to the 8 in the luminosity, you also yes. have a discrepancy, so... Yeah, but that is, that is it's very hard observationally to, to get the luminosity function right here. So that is actually, this first point typically you don't have to trust yet, because that's incompleteness of the observations. Again, you also see that sometimes there's quite a big discrepancy between different data sets. For example, here, mm -hmm. and you see there, they're quite far apart because they use yeah. different telescopes, different samples, and especially in these low luminosity regimes and also in the mm -hmm. high luminosity regimes, it's very hard to do these measurements observationally. Okay, thank you. Welcome. But the, the problem is if we go to 
higher redshifts. So we can, yeah, in, in, in our Eagle skirt universe, it's fairly easy to go to higher redshift. You just take another snapshot and you do the same, you apply the same tricks. And so this is what you see here. So this is again, 250 micron luminosity functions, but now at different redshifts, going from redshift zero to the green one, redshift one. And what you see is that the luminosity function changes and actually it's what we call pure luminosity evolution, meaning the same curve just moves sidewards. It's for the rest, it's exactly the same curve more or less. So meaning that galaxies just get on average more luminous in the infrared if you go to higher redshift. And you have that also in the total infrared and you have that also in the dust mass. So if you go to higher redshifts, the, get, the universe was slightly more dusty. Although the evolution here is very mild and here it's still very mild. And we can actually look at this in another way because these para parametrized lines are modified Schechter fits. And we can look at the total emissivity, so the total emission of galaxies at say 250 micron. And then you see that indeed, galaxies get more luminous if redshift increases. So going to higher redshift, the average luminosity of a galaxy increases. But if you compare that to observational estimates, our evolution is by far not strong enough. So you get way stronger evolution from the data than we get from the Eagle simulation. And we get the same for the total infrared, for the dust mass, the data points are, there's a lot of scatter on them, but we seem to be doing a better job. So our conclusion here is that our evolution of the dust mass function is in relatively good agreement with observations, but the evolution of the infrared luminosity function strongly underestimates the observations. And the conclusion then must be that dust grains must have been more luminous in the past for this, the same kilogram of dust must have emitted more in the past than it is emitting today. Is this because of resolution? Because that might be a problem. Our galaxies, if you go to higher redshift, they get fewer particles, so more galaxies drop out, so we might miss some galaxies. So that might definitely be an option. Um, it's also possible that the Eagle simulation itself is not perfect and that it gradually underestimates the star formation rate. If at higher redshift the star formation rate was slightly higher, the dust would be hotter and hotter dust would emit more. So that could be part of the solution. We don't have AGN heating yet in our um, post-processing scheme. And so as the AGNs were more important at higher redshift, this could also possibly explain part of the discrepancy. But what I think is the most important part is dust evolution. So we have calibrated our simulations based on the local universe, but nothing says that the dust at higher redshifts behaves in the same way. Maybe dust grains were different. Maybe they were smaller, maybe they were bigger, maybe they were made of different material, maybe they were more crystalline. There's just many things we don't know yet about the evolution of dust itself. And that could also partly explain the discrepancies we see here. And so that is more or less where we are now. And so we're trying to dig deeper into this comparison between observations and simulations. And one way to go is to go to higher resolution simulations. And this is, for example, this is work by PG student uh, Anand Tutsaf Kapoor. And he is looking at the Auriga galaxies. Now, every Auriga galaxy is not like an Eagle galaxy, 10,000 particles, this is a million particles. So the resolution here is fantastic. And so we can generate these very, very high resolution images. And one way to test whether simulations are more or less in agreement with observations is to look for characteristics or properties that were not put in the calibration or not put in by hand 
And one of those is galaxy morphology. So the morphology of a galaxy in a simulation is not something that the simulators put in. They didn't put in that galaxies should have spiral arms or so. It's just a, a result of the physical pro properties they put in. And so that's a fantastic way to test the fidelity of cosmological simulations. And this is nicely illustrated by, by this beautiful work by, by Vicente, where he developed a package to measure galaxy morphology in a non-parametric way. So like to really assign numbers to the morphology. And then and if you apply that to mock observations and to actual data, you can then compare how the two compare. And for example, here you see two of these um, parameters, the Gini coefficient and the M20 parameter. And you see the galaxies from the Penn star survey in the plane of these two parameters. And then you can somehow separate it into early types, late types, and mergers. And you see this, this the distribution in this plane agrees more or less with the concentration index. That's yet another parameter. Now, if you do the same trick for simulated galaxies from the illustrious simulation, this looks nowhere like this. So it's very different distribution. And if you look now at the illustrious TNG simulation, that's the improved version of illustrious, the most recent version of illustrious with different recipes, this is a much better agreement. So you see a very nice agreement now between observations and um, simulations. This is in the optical. And since we prefer to work multi-wavelength, we thought, why don't we just apply this StatMorph package, not only to optical images, but to images over the entire wavelength range, going all the way from UV to Spire. And this, these are uh, galaxies from the, the Spedia sample. We took the biggest galaxy, so they have enough resolution. And so we measured some of these, these parameters or these indices as a function of wavelength. And that is what you see here. And I'll zoom in a little bit. For example, here you have this concentration index going from UV to submillimeter and for stellar mass, for dust mass, for star formation rate maps. And you see that galaxies typically are not very concentrated in the UV. They're way more concentrated in the optical, the near infrared, and then going to the far infrared and submillimeter again, they get more extended or less concentrated. And you can look at same at the smoothness, you can look at the asymmetry and so on. So these are things you can measure by looking at images at different wavelengths. And we thought this is a nice, uh, nice way to test the fidelity. We can do that also with our Auriga galaxies. And this is what Anand is doing. And so the yellow bars now are the Auriga galaxies compared to the sample of the Spedia galaxies. This is just, he made this plot this week. Um, and you see some indices agree fairly well. You see, you get the same trends here. Others, we have a little bit of discrepancy in the submillimeter, so it's not perfect yet. But at least this is a very nice way to test the multi-wavelength morphology. Um, and there's a lot of ongoing work there, apart from that we apply this same techniques to many different simulations, so not only Eagle, but also Illustrious TNG and the Simba simulations, so on. We also look at different diagnostics to test these simulations and to predict uh, ways to improve them. For example, we look at resolved kinematics because we can also include stellar and gas kinematics into our radio transfer code. And so we can generate mock integral field spectroscopic data and compare them to real data. We can look at the scaling relations. We can look at gas physics. Uh, we, can we are looking at polarimetry in the infrared to compare with Planck and make predictions for Spica. And we're trying to work on just evolution models to see how we can improve uh, this agreement there. And there's many different avenues that we're um, thinking of. And so if any of you is interested to, to join this work, you're most welcome to join this effort. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. <laughs>
Okay, let's see some hands up for questions. Maybe maybe I can ask uh, the first yes, question. Please. All right. Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, great talk. I think it's uh, fascinating to hear about all of this. Thank you. Um, so, in your in your in your slide about the the um, like the cosmic uh, SED, um, you said that resolution could could be the um, the culprit for uh, some. Uh, some of the discrepancies. Uh, so I, I know I know that resolution is a is a, one of the biggest uh, limitations in this comparison. So I, I want to hear a bit more about, about, about uh, what are your thoughts about uh, how, yeah. how bad. Uh, well, the big the, the biggest issue is the UV part. And so, if you have a fixed amount of dust and a fixed amount of starlight, and you put it all homogeneously in the same box you get a completely different result than if you put it in a very clumpy way. And so the fact that we cannot resolve a number of structures that we'd like to resolve, we probably strongly underestimate the attenuation. And if you underestimate the attenuation, you also underestimate the far infrared emission, but we fit the far infrared, so we probably assign it to more dust. So, so there's, there's a whole chain, a nonlinear chain of things that can go wrong if you underestimate the attenuation in the UV. And we think that is the biggest problem at this stage. And that's why we hope that if you look for higher resolved galaxies, where you do resolve the dust and, and the, the interstellar medium much better, that you can constrain this geometry in a, in a better way. Right, right, yeah, thanks, I, I, I agree. <laughs> Thanks, Presenter. Uh, Vero? Uh, hey. Uh, I was just wondering, there's some problem with, uh, well, I think that there's a difference with a uh, black hole TNG. So I was wondering with, uh, with Auriga and the simulation that you're using, so if there's like some dirty things about the black holes, you know this thing, because you were saying that the that the dust can be more uh, luminous depending on mm -hmm. the sun formation rate. So the, the stellar feedback, right? So it was yes. I was wondering about the AGN feedback about black holes. Yes, well, there's two parts. This this AGN feedback is included, of course, in all these simulations, and so the feedback makes sure that star formation shuts down and so on, and that gas is expelled and heated. Um, so in the simulations, in the hydro simulations, black hole feedback is included. But we have not, yes. we have not included the thermal effect of an AGN. So AGNs are very luminous uh, parts. They can heat the dust, they can emit uh, in the far infrared as well. And we have not added that contribution to our post-processing recipe. That is the that is the missing link that we are still missing. And how big are the black hole seeds? I don't know. Um, ah, okay. I don't know. I, 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 I know because I, I'm not involved in in the hydro simulations themselves. I just use mm -hmm. their output. Um, but there there are papers on black hole evolution um, at different redshifts. And I think that yeah. that is fairly in fairly good agreement with observational constraints. Yeah. I, I was like really, uh, I don't know, I get really excited with some things. But I was, I was really excited about this dust evolution. I think it blows my mind like, oh, it's a great idea. So I don't know if you have something a little more like to say, even if it's like a preliminary or something. Um, well, we have not started implementing it yet. There are simulations that do include a number of dust evolution recipes. Um, I think they're still far from being a big improvement over what we have today. Um, but we do see a lot of evidence for dust evolution even in the local universe. So we have in regions in, in, in more dense regions, we see that the dust grains are bigger. We see that they're less aligned in dense regions. Um, 
um, typically they, they get different material because typically they get ice mantles and so they get different optical properties. On the other hand, if dust is exposed to hot radiation, say x-rays or so, the dust gets shattered and you get smaller grains. So there is, there is clear evidence for evolution, but how this would then lead to different observational characteristics is still up to debate. Okay, thank you. It was a great talk, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vera. And uh, Jacopo? <clears throat> so, Martin, you, uh, in one of the slides, you were showing a discrepancy between uh, the properties of uh, basically red and blue galaxies. Mm -hmm. And you said, or maybe I understood, no, I didn't understand correctly, that uh, you, can, you did not model a dust pool galaxy because they are dust pool. Yeah, but you could, in principle, model dust pool galaxy without any problem. Well, you can for these dust pool galaxies. We can generate the optical properties. That's that's easy because that there's no dust. But it's very hard if you only have say five dust particles to generate a realistic far infrared mm. emission, because you just cannot. So the so, problem is again the resolution. Problem is resolution, yes. Okay, okay, then much more clear. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So that's, and, and it, it's, it's really annoying. It's not a problem in the optical, it's a problem in the far infrared. Okay. Thanks, Jacopo. Uh, any other questions? I have a question, Martin. Uh, so, uh, again, about this dust evolution uh, point that you made. Uh, so, uh, can you explain, uh, have you checked, uh, or rather I should ask, how robust is that result uh, against mineralogy and uh, the source of the optical constants that you're using in uh, your radio transfer coil? That's, a, that's a, a big debate in that community as well, because okay. there's different dust models and some people say, for, like, one of, one of the, one of the most known dust models is, is the one for, by Bruce Drain, who is, um, yeah, he's, he's the expert, but some of his dust properties are kind of changed by hand to make it fit, while other people use lab data that are not in agreement. And so there's, there's a debate on different dust models and they have different emissivities. And one of the most recent results of the um, dust model that we are using is the one by Anthony Jones, um, the Themis dust model, is that is, it is, for the same dust mass, more emissive in the farm for it. So that could partly explain some of the discrepancies, not all of them, but even then with his dust model, he, he told us like a few weeks ago, like we're, we're making a, a new version and again it's different again and so this is not only the dust evolves also the modeling of the dust evolves yeah okay and Thanks. there's still a lot lot of a lot of uncertainty so indeed yeah, yeah. uh Jacopo, again yeah sorry that another question came to mind um in, in the cosmic scd uh you show that there is uh, a i would say small discrepancy between uh, in the near infrared between uh, models and observations. Uh, could this be due to the, yeah, exactly. Uh, in the near infrared, I would say. So yeah. could this be due, uh, have you explored this? Because this could be AGB stars, right? So this could be, is most likely in the models. Yeah, it is. No, there's different contributors there. It's also here, we did not include the dust poor galaxies. So that's part of the discrepancy, but not all of it. And so part of it could also be the stellar population models. Indeed, if you have different stellar population models, it's the same as with the dust models. Some of them are more emissive in the near infrared. Some of them are less emissive. So that could explain part of the discrepancy as well. Um, but it's also the case that on average, the eagle volume is is, has a slightly different stellar po uh, galaxy population mix than the observed universe. And so 
that could also cause a little bit of a bias. And uh, have you tried to make a similar plot, but uh, in uh, like uh, with some morphological mass segregation or in morphological or mass bin? Yes, yes, we did. But I don't know the results anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we put it at different masses to see which mass range dominates the budget. But I can't, re I can't remember it. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks. And Jacopo. Any other questions? We have time for one more question. Okay. Okay, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thanks, Mark. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much. <laughs>